Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, my name is Andrew McPherson. Uh, I'm gonna be teaching you the module five, which is the SE DNA seq uh, module, uh, the single cell genomics on the DNA side. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my, myself. So I um, started my graduate studies in BC, uh, Vancouver, BC in Canada. Uh, I was working with Dr. Saurabh Shah and Dr. Aparicio at first on uh, computational methods for bulk whole, um, whole genome sequencing, trying to de deconvolute the multiple clones that were evident in that type of data. Um, and I uh, was happy when I could start to work on single cell techniques because they really uh, allowed us to um, look at clonal structure in a way that didn't require us to uh, to overcome the issues of bulk sequencing. Um, so then I, with Dr. Shaw and Dr. Apercio, I, I we developed the platform direct library preparation and uh, collaboration with them. And uh, I worked mainly on the computational side. Uh, and uh, from that work, um, I guess it, from my experience with DLP and single cell, I was then offered a position at MSK in New York, and that's where I'm, uh, I am right now. Uh, so I'll just jump right into it. Um, so this is the Creative Commons uh, license. This basically means that uh, you are free to share, copy, distribute, uh, transmit the work uh, here, herein, uh, to remix if you like, and adapt in your own work um, under the conditions that you attribute uh, the work in a manner specific, specified by the author or licensor, and that you, um, if you alter this work, then you share it um, under the same license, I believe. That's the, the stipulations. Um, okay. So, uh, I'm sure you've already been introduced to this somewhat, but um, we and probably know this already, but cancer is definitely a, uh, driven by an evolutionary process. Uh, and that evolutionary process involves mutational, uh, mutational processes acting on the genome uh, together with imperfect DNA replication um, or um, DNA repair that is malfunctioned in some way that promotes genetic changes that transform cells from a phenotype that uh, favors the organism's survival to a selfish malignant phenotype that favors unbounded cell division. Um, increased cell division together with disabled uh, repair mechanisms promote genome instability resulting in further clonal heterogeneity. Um, and then from that heterogeneity uh, will be selected populations that are able to invade adjacent tissue um, evade the immune system, evade treatment, and metastasize. Um, and so really cancer evolution is the reason why we're interested in, in um, heterogeneity because uh, by being able to look at heterogeneity, we're able to uh, reconstruct and understand the evolutionary patterns that led to that heterogeneity. And then we're able to predict potentially um, by, Complete under, with a complete understanding of that heterogeneity, we'd be able to predict um, what will happen future, in the future clinically to a patient uh, in which we've observed that cellular heterogeneity. Uh, so every single cell talk, I think, has to have um, a slide about maybe smoothies or some analogy like this. Uh, I think that the picture we'd like to see is this colorful picture of all of these different types of berries. Um, of course, the traditional techniques that we apply to the sequencing of genomes uh, take that very interesting mixture and blend it up. Um, and then we perhaps uh, have this difficult process of trying to deconvol deconvolute uh, what went into this mixture using uh, the that produce the bulk genome sequencing. Um, so uh, at the end of this lecture, I would hope that you have learned or have a knowledge of single cell DNA sequencing techniques 
Um, you understand how scDNA uh, data is analyzed for copy number changes, uh, single cell nucleotide or single nucleotide variants, uh, specific for specifically for understanding the evolutionary patterns of the single nucleotide variants and the copy number changes. Um, and perhaps be aware of the pitfalls in each type of analysis and know how to um, SCDNA has been used thus far to study cancer. Um, so single cell sequencing in effect is uh, multiplex sequencing of single cells using DNA barcodes. I think that aptly describes um, all of the, the many various techniques that we can call uh, single cell uh, DNA sequencing. The basic steps on the molecular biology side are dissociation into single cell suspensions, um, isolation of single cells, uh, cell lysis and uh, cell lysis, and also removing uh, bound proteins from the DNA, so cleaning the DNA, followed by uh, indexing or barcoding the cells so they can be identified later in downstream analyses, and then amplification and library preparation. And so most of the protocols involve um, some variation on these steps. Uh, single cell dissociation is the, the first step that involves um, dissection, rinsing, and mincing, um, adding of digestive enzymes uh, and incubation. These, these steps are uh, definitely tricky and very important in terms of optimization, uh, especially for fragile uh, cell populations from um, difficult to sequence tumor specimens. So it's an important step. Um, cell isolation is, uh, is the next step in the process. And this th there's definitely a variety of different techniques that have been used, um, such as uh, limiting dilution. So that's where we, we dilute to the point where statistically speaking, uh, we know that if we spot a certain quantity into a, a set of wells, then um, by chance, it's very unlikely there'll be two cells in each well. Of course, uh, often there's zero cells, um, which is one problem with that solution. Um, there's techniques like capillary pipette um, that are somewhat laborious. Uh, laser ca capture microdissection to some extent can be think thought of as a single cell technique. Uh, microfluidics, I think, are one of the more important techniques as they allow this, this platform to scale. Um, and fax and blood collection are also so techniques that have been used. Once we have been able to isolate the cells perhaps into, um, into, into an array of wells, then the next step is to index those two um, types of indexing that have been shown here. The one that I'm most familiar with is the combinatorial indexing. Um, th this index type of indexing involves having a unique uh, barcode per row and then another unique barcode per column, uh, possibly with the duplication of those barcode sequences, but that done in such a way that um, each unique pair um, of barcodes uniquely specifies the location within this within the um, set of wells that the cell would have come from. Um, and then there's also non-redundant indexing in which every well has a, a completely unique pair. Um, in the early days of whole genome, uh, single cell whole genome sequencing or cells, single cell DNA sequencing, these are the three techniques. Um, somewhat, still somewhat relevant today. Uh, .PCR was a technique that used, um, primarily used uh, PCR. Um, MDA uses uh, an isothermal um, amplification technique using a more accurate uh, polymerase. Um, and there, then there's also hybrid techniques that are a little bit more involved um, like Malbec or Picoplex I think the main takeaway is uh, that there are differences uh, between these two, three techniques with respect to um, sort of the error profile and what you would be able to do with these techniques. So dot PCR uh, has a high um, rate of um, 
errors that are introduced by the polymerase, whereas um, MDA has a low rate of errors that are introduced that allow it to be used uh, comparatively better for single, uh, single nucleotide variation. Um, the dot PCR has um, relatively higher uh, uniformity. Sorry for the double negative in the slide. Um, so dot PCR, because of the uniformity of coverage across the genome, it is better for uh, copy number calling. So an alternative, um, which is uh, the technique that we use in our lab for DLP is direct um, tagmentation of an unamplified genome uh, prior to any kind of amplification that's applied after the fact. Um, this uses a, a transposon, um, a TN5 transposase uh, loaded with uh, library adapters uh, to uh, basically fragment um, the DNA um, and also add adapters for sequencing to that DNA. Um, what happens is uh, the, the DNA is, is tagmented. So these, uh, these TN5s, they uh, cut the DNA and introduce these uh, primers, and then the primers are used for uh, dual barcoding in which we um, do a minimal amount of PCR, just enough to um, introduce the barcodes into the, into the amplified sequences so that the DNA is barcoded for um, identity, identifying the cell of origin of the sequences later. Um, another technique that is, I think is quite um, interesting and, and novel is single cell combinatorial index sequencing. And this uses a, um, a split and repooling approach uh, to ensure that uh, for the most part, cells are uniquely barcoded, even though they're never isolated into um, individual wells, for one for each cell. So what happens is in a first, uh, in a first part of the experiment, uh, the uh, a first barcode, uh, set, first set of barcodes is introduced into the nuclei, uh, keeping the nuclei intact using a TN5 transposase. And so you have pools of nuclei that are um, uniquely barcoded. Each set of nuclei is uniquely barcoded. And then these sets of uniquely barcoded nuclei are pooled together and then redistributed. And uh, during a second barcoding step using PCR, they're barcoded with a second set of barcodes. And the hope is that it's statistically unlikely that um, a cell or nuclei would, uh, would um, in, end up in the same set of wells across these two uh, grouping and splitting and redistributing uh, steps as another cell. So no two cells hopefully would end up in, this, in this, the same well as in the top and the same well in the bottom. And therefore all cells would be uniquely barcoded. Of course, this doesn't, um, there is some error rate to, the, to this process. So I think there is maybe five to 10% of, uh, of the barcode pairs end up being, um, for two or more cells. And finally, the method that was developed in our lab and that we now have at MSK is called direct library preparation. This uses cell isolation using a piezoelectric dispenser. So this is uh, it's a droplet dispenser that dispenses into a nanowell array uh, by effectively using a small, um, a small, uh, acoustic uh, pulse to create small droplets. And uh, together with an onboard camera, uh, we are able to, uh, we are able to, able to observe as we're dispensing droplets when there is a cell within the dispensation region. And when we observe a cell uh, or when the machine observes a cell, it automatically takes uh, the nozzle and and dispenses the next droplet into the, the well in the nanowell array. Uh, this is followed by steps 
that do additional imaging, add uh, lysis buffers, uh, do uh, TN5 tagmentation, do addi additional reagent steps, and then pool the resulting tagged DNA uh, and do regular sequencing on a Lumina sequencing machine. Tenex CMB, I'll mention, but um, unfortunately it was discontinued. Um, this technique uses, use, uses an emulsion of, of droplets. Uh, there's sort of two steps here, where in first step in which uh, droplets are, and um, droplets are, sorry, cells or nuclei are placed into droplets using this microfluidic system. And then following that, those, uh, those droplets with cells in them um, are run through another microfluidics device that incorporates these gel beads, which um, have the um, additional reagents and barcodes that are needed for, uh, for the next steps, which involve um, independent amplification within each of these droplets, followed by pooling and then regular Illumina sequencing. Um, and I think that the final type of, of single cell sequencing I'll mention, just because now it has a commercial platform and um, we're starting to see more publications using this platform is, is the Tapestry platform for Mission Bio. Uh, this is also droplet-based. Um, so it involves a very similar set of steps where cells or nuclei are incorporated into, um, into uh, droplets of oil uh, in an emulsion. And then within that, those droplets, Independently, uh, we have uh, distinct um, barcodes, I5 and I7 barcodes, and together with gene-specific primers, uh, we do a PCR uh, to amplify specific genes and also add cell-specific barcodes. So this is a very this is a target approach that involves developing a panel, um, but it can be very high throughput. Okay, so in the next part of the talk, I'll, I'll describe uh, SCDNA data and analyses. Um, some of the analyses that are possible using DNA-seq uh, are un to uncover clonal substructure. So looking at uh, different populations of cells and how they differ in their um, protected perhaps driver genes or mutational processes, um, looking at clonal lineages, so understanding basically the, the evolutionary relationships between those clones, um, looking at tumor, tumor evolution perhaps over time where we uh, have time series measurements of, of clones um, from which we can understand changes in clonal abundance, and then also looking at mutation co-occurrence. Um, but first, Here's sort of a first look at uh, one of the data types, two data types I'll talk about the most in the, this set of slides, um, which is low coverage single cell whole genome sequencing. Um, this encompasses uh, DLP uh, and uh, 10X CNV would have also been a low coverage single cell uh, technique and some of the other techniques like DOP PCR are a bit higher coverage, but they're also uh, much less lower, much lower coverage than a regular whole genome sequencing. So this is what you would first look, see when you open up uh, one of the BAM files in IGV. Um, as we zoom out a bit, we can see that uh, hopefully we get even coverage um, on average. And that coverage, when we look at any two cells, isn't biased to particular regions in the genome. And that's what we've optimized for in um, DLP and others have optimized for um, with say DOL PCR or um, 10x CNV. I think um, given that the coverage is low for these types of sequencing assays, uh, these really are copy number primary assays. And so the first step is a copy number analysis, almost certainly. Um, copy number calling in single cell whole genome, it's, I think, uh, Sarana will have introduced you to this, and it's um, quite similar. Um, so briefly, bin reads across the genome are binned into regular um, or irregular length bins. Um, we have GC correction, 
and mappability correction as the next steps, removal of outlier bins, and then removal of outlier cells, uh, followed by segmentation and copy number calling. Sometimes those two are, are done jointly. Um, just to give you an idea of how important uh, GC correction is, this is uh, one of the cells that we sequenced with, with DLP. If you overlay uh, the GC of each bin, the average GC of each bin, bin you can see that there's a strong relationship. And then if you um, look at that relationship as a scatter plot between reads on the y-axis and, and GC on the x-axis, you do see there's this uh, sort of Nike swoosh shape um, that uh, shows a, this sort of bias that you get that's characteristic of sequencing. Um, going back here, this, uh, this bias is usually corrected by some kind of uh, polynomial or low S regression that's fit to this, uh, this curve and then uh, we reg effectively reg regress out the contribution of GC to the, to the biases in read depth coverage. Segmentation uh, involves um, a few different approaches. So we can have a, a sliding window approach. Um, CBS is one of the, these types of sliding window, window approaches. Um, CBS stands for circular binary segmentation. This is a uh, procedure where we iteratively uh, look for intervals of the genome that have a, uh, that um, are outliers with respect to coverage. And then we iteratively build up a list of regions that um, have differential signal between their neighboring regions. Um, a hidden, hidden Markov models are another option for this type of analysis, and that's uh, these are what we use primarily in our lab. Um, they allow joint calling of the segments and the, the copy number state through this Markov process at, at the bottom right here, which basically describes the different probabilities of going from one copy state to another as you move across the genome. You may find, um, you, you may um, sort of, I guess, uh, you know, some of the intuition you have can be encoded as a prior into this uh, kind of transition structure such that, um, for, in for instance, you don't often transition into a homozygous deletion state because you don't expect many homozygous deletions uh, in your typical genome. And so um, learning that transition matrix um, allows you to um, infer what kind of transitions are more likely, um, and then at the same time um, infer the actual states for different regions of the genome and uh, what the boundaries are for those, those states within the, within the genome. Um, finally, there's another approach called an objective function-based approach that doesn't do uh, copy number calling at the same time, but does, uh, does effectively a, a segmentation with um, a specific uh, like mathematical objective function that it's trying to optimize for. So I, I would say the objective function ap approach is similar to the sliding window CBS approach, but um, instead it's trying to optimize a specific, a specific objective. Um, these are nicer approaches and uh, yeah, uh, I think they're a good option also. Excuse me. Yeah. In the in the previous sessions, uh, they talked about the different positions in the genome have a relationship to each other. They called it linkage, I remember, something like that. When you use a Markov model, uh, the assumption of Markov, as far as I remember, is that the probability of going to uh, state, the next state doesn't uh, have any relationship to the previous state. But here, if two states are related, you can't go to the other state. How do you assume this kind of assumption? Um, which, can I ask which um, module that was? So I think linkage, that would probably refer 
to genetic linkage in these are genomic positions aren't they so yeah so doesn't mean that the co copy number in different positions should have a relationship to each other yeah that is a very good point i i think maybe not um well maybe i misunderstand your use of the term linkage but um what i will say is you're absolutely correct uh, because one thing that and I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about this very much in this uh, set of slides, uh, one thing that we're missing here is the different connections between these segments uh, that are implied by genomic rearrangement. Um, and so those certainly, uh, you know, those certainly violate the assumption that we have in the markup process that a bin is a bin's copy number is only dependent on its adjacent bins, not on distant bins in the genome. Because, uh, you know, we could have instances where th the genome has been rearranged by, by these very complex processes that take different parts of um, other chromosomes and juxtapose them with um, different positions in, an, in a different chromosome. And so that in those situations, yeah, I mean, this is a, a very, very much a simplification and a model that, you know, is, is more useful than it is um, um, absolutely realistic. Does that make sense? So, so we, we assume it, but it's not a realistic model. Yeah, the it's useful conclusion. more than realistic for sure, <laughs> like most models. Okay. okay, and and can we assume it like for? I didn't understand that rearrangement that you talked about. Can, can you please explain that a little more? Sure. Um, can you see my cursor on the slide? Yeah, I guess. OK. Um, so you know, we're saying that this, uh, these bins here that I'm circling in, in, in red are only really de dependent. Their state is only dependent on the neighboring ones or the ones um, perhaps neighboring in this nearby amplified set of bins. Um, only the adjacent bins impact the probability of your state in, under a Markov process. But you know, what if this purple region over on the right um, has been sort of cut from this right part of this chromosome and joined uh, to some part of this chromosome um, in green? Um, or Perhaps that's, uh, I'm trying to come up with an example that's um, off the cuff, but actually here's maybe a better example. So um, this is um, amplified, but we also don't need to know the or orientation of this green segment. It could have been reversed and amplified. And so that would mean that um, this, these bins here are actually adjacent to these bins over here. Um, does that make yeah, sense? Got it. Yeah, that okay. makes sense. Thank cool. you. Uh, okay, so an example of copy number in a single cell. Um, this is uh, the cell. I think is a lymphoblastoid cell line. It's uh, near diploid. Actually, I'm wrong. This is uh, this is actually the OB2295 data um, high grade serous ovarian cancer cell lines that we'll be working with in the lab. Um, so this is. Baseline uh, diplo diploid, uh, a median copy number of two, but you see that there are quite a few amplifications and deletions. So it's, um, it's a female sample, obviously, so it doesn't have a Y chromosome. Um, and then this is copy number in a tetraploid cell in, in the same sample. And um, one question is how, how can you tell from this data that um, it, this is a good solution that it's actually tetraploid versus diploid. Uh, and the key thing to look for here is these copy number states uh, at, a, at a level of copy number of two, or sorry, three, or uh, there may be some copy number five somewhere here too. So it's, um, and here's an, a copy number one segment. So uh, in terms of evaluating whether or not you have a good copy number solution, um, one of the questions you should ask is whether or not the, the ploidy is something is correct or makes sense given the data. 
And in this case, we can see that it probably does because we have these odd numbered copy number segments that help us sort of anchor to these, um, anchor to these, th this solution. Uh, of course, um, we could end up with a solution like this. Uh, and here the question is, you know, there's no odd numbered copy number states that are helping us to assess whether that the, or ascertain that this is a tetraploid cell. Um, and given that there's no significant segments um, at any of the odd numbered states, we could divide the entire set of copy numbers by two and get uh, an equal, equally reasonable uh, genome that would be baseline diploid. And this is the identifiability of copy number problem that uh, doesn't go away with single cell for sure. Um, and is perhaps exhibited here. This is just showing how well we can fit uh, an HMM model to um, data of using um, different ploidy solutions. And you can see that um, this is the log, log likelihood. So um, actually it's the negative log likelihood. So uh, the, the smaller this is, the better. And we can see that we could just keep in, in, um, increasing the ploidy and we would uh, keep getting a better fit according to our model for the data. So unfortunately, um, things like measuring the likelihood of your model in an HMM don't give you any idea of whether or not you should pick a tetraploid over a diploid solution. Okay, so that's copy number. I'm gonna jump into a phylogenetic analysis. Um, and first talk about uh, the different models that are being used for phylogenetic analysis in um, SED and ASIC data. I think the most prevalent is uh, because of its simplicity is this assumption of the infinite sites um, that leads us to the perfect phylogeny model. Um, the infinite sites assumptions uh, is the assumption that mutations occur only once throughout the tree. Um, and that there's no reversions of those mutations or parallel uh, mutation. Um, and that can be shown in the, an example of this is, is shown in the bottom right. This is actually from um, Next Drain, which is about viral evolution, um, but the, the, the really the principles are the same here. Um, these mutations, uh, once they originate, you see that they propagate to all of the descendants. This blue mutation is exhibited in A, B, C, D, and E um, because it originated near the root of the tree. Um, and then this, this red mutation is only in C, uh, and this yellow mutation is in um, all three of its descendant um, genomes or sequences. Oops. Um, so the rationale here for the infinite sites assumption is that the genome is quite large and mutations are, although they uh, do happen frequently, they're relatively infrequent compared to the size of the genome. You maybe get a, uh, 10, 20, maybe 100,000 mutations um, in a very highly mutated uh, patient sample, but the genome itself uh, is three gigabases of, of sequence. So uh, relatively speaking, the, the, the chance of any one particular location in the, or nucleotide in the genome of being mutated is low for that particular location. Of course, um, this is a, similar to an HMM. It's um, a useful but imperfect model. Um, we do know that there can be violations to the infinite sites assumption, in including um, convergent evolution where there is a strong fitness advantage to mutating a particular uh, gene in cancer. Uh, there's also the possibility that there's a back mutation. Um, those have been observed, for instance, uh, in BCR, BRCA patients that are, uh, that are treated with PARP inhibitors, you can get a uh, reversion of a BR, BRCA mutation. Um, and you can also have instances where uh, mutations can be lost by copy number change. 
Uh, so uh, two alternative models here are finite sites. This is just um, sort of, a, I guess, a, um, a free-for-all model, if you could put it that way. Uh, mutations can occur, they can reoccur, they can back mutate. So anything is possible in, the, in this model. Um, another mo model that I've used um, in my work is the DOLA model. Mutations can occur only once in this model, um, somewhat like the infinite site assumption. So assuming that the, the genome is large relative to the rate of mutation, um, but they can be lost, um, for instance, through copy number change that deletes the, uh, the segment that harbors the mutation. And once they're lost, they cannot reoccur. Um, in a study uh, uh, published last year, and through an analysis of single cell data, um, the authors claim to find um, quite a bit of, of evidence for uh, violations of the ISA in, in real um, single cell sequencing data, including parallel evolution, loss of heterozygosity, so deletion of a, a region that contains an SMB, um, and also back mutation. When the, Within the context of single cell, one of the, um, this is not necessarily a model, but uh, sort of a simplification in the way modeling is done. Um, because often single cells um, are quite similar, uh, we find that, for instance, um, this red mutation uh, is differentiates this population of three cells from all of the other cells. But within this population of three cells, uh, they, these cells are genotypically equivalent. Um, and so often what is done is to create something called a mutation tree, which is just uh, using mutations on internal nodes to show the structure of um, the evolution of mutations. And then cells um, hang off of these in internal nodes in clusters uh, to represent which, uh, which mutations are in which cells. So for instance, this set here of, of cells have all of the mutations that were acquired above um, in ancestral uh, nodes. Um, these two blue mutations and this red mutation. You'll notice that this mutation tree on the right here is, is using the perfect phylogeny model. One of the methods that, um, first methods that came out that did this inference, uh, this type of inference where they try to, try to build a mutation tree um, from noisy SMV presence absence data is called site. Uh, so the data here that's, that's input to this, this method is just observations of uh, presence or absence uh, of a particular mutation in a particular cell. So the, the sort of upstream um, analysis done as part of a bioinformatics pipeline will just will give you counts of reads uh, for each mutation for each cell for ref the reference or the variant. And then um, as a first step, the site authors just distill that down as, as did we see any, enough mutations um, or enough mismatches in the reads that would support a particular uh, SMB to say the SMB is present. If we did, we mark uh, a one in this matrix. If we didn't, we mark a zero. If we didn't really see any reads that overlapped that particular mutation at all, then we have a missing value. And um, unfortunately, uh, missing values are quite prevalent in this type of, of data, as you'll see when we do the lab. Um, just because you have something called allelic dropout that happens. So in the amplification, um, you can have um, you can have preference of amplification of one region over another, resulting in very few reads coming from one region of interest in a particular cell. So um, site, the site authors propose a, a method that takes this data and produces this mutation tree. I won't go into the details of, of the method. Um, another method is sci-fi. This is uh, more relevant 
because we are going to be using a sci-fi inferred tree in our lab. Um, and this is a slightly different approach because it goes from, uh, it pro they propose a model that incorporates both, both the read level data and the tree modeling the presence of absence and absence of mutations across uh, the set of cells. And um, so they, in a combined fashion, call the, the presence or absence of the particular SMVs in each cell and reconstruct the tr tree at the same time in an integrated way and then call mutations um, by doing posterior inference over the inferred model. Um, and then finally, a, a method that my colleague and I published um, in 2016 um, doesn't do phylogeny inference, but I'm showcasing here because uh, it gives you some insight into one of the one of the um, potential pitfalls of this type of data and this type of analysis, which is doublets. Um, and I think I, I find the colors here a little bit confusing, but uh, so if you'll allow me to um, sort of explain them, A is the reference um, means that there's only the reference reads that are occupying this particular or covering this particular mutation in this particular cell. Um, a, B is heterozygous and B is homozygous for the variant. And so um, that means that we have this uh, collection of cells down here that have essentially all of the, the variants that we have profiled. Again, here the, the columns are variants, um, triple nucleotide variants, and then the rows are cells. So these cells in clone three have all of the variants, at least um, heterozygously. Um, and in comparison to these populations at the top, zero and one, which have just a subset of the variants. Um, and a priori we knew, uh, we happen to know from in this experiment that these particular cells were, um, or at least the data in these particular rows comes from multiple cells and likely from a uh, combination of the cells in zero and the cells in uh, clone one. So clone uh, three is essentially cells, um, pairs of cells from zero and one. Um, and then of course, if you infer a tree from that kind of data, you get something that's much more complex than you expect. Um, oops. And by contrast, if you use a method, which is uh, what we proposed in this paper, that is capable of filtering doublets, then you end up getting a much simpler, more realistic tree. All right, uh, what about phylogenetics and copy number data? That's certainly an important problem. And um, we have, there's, there's been much less work on that, uh, probably because it's, it's quite a difficult problem and possibly also because uh, single cell whole genome sequencing is more, um, quite a bit newer than uh, techniques that uh, look at um, had SMVs in single cells. And the, the method that we've proposed uh, recently in a bioarchive paper is called SICA. This is Bayesian phylogenetic inference from um, SCWGS derived copy number data. And the idea here is to uh, use transitions in, in copy number state in individual cells as um, as binary, as phylogenetic markers, and then perform inference on those uh, markers. And the assumptions here are that we don't have any loss of change points through deletion, which is a somewhat strong assumption in some contexts. Um, and we also have um, the assumption that change point distance approximates uh, evolutionary different distance. And I'm, I'm showing at the bottom here uh, what I mean by this idea that we use copy number transitions as markers. So um, for instance, in A, we have perhaps an amplification that results in two copy number transitions, um, one at the beginning of the amplification and another at the end of the amplification. Uh, stacked on top, perhaps we have an, a subsequent amplification that introduces two more copy number transitions, so two more additional markers. And then in the middle, you hear, excuse me, you can see um, 
where we have an instance of a duplication, overlapping, and deletion that results in the removal of these change points. And so this is an instance where the, the model is not gonna, going to sufficiently capture the, the, the changes that differentiate um, these different genomes. Um, the data looks um, like this uh, for Sitka. So we take uh, a copy number matrix that you see here, uh, rows again are cells and, and um, along the, the y-axis in this heat map is chromosomal positions. So we take data that looks like this and we try to um, infer these binary indicators of transition points and then build a tree as you see on the left. Uh, and I think and a competing method that's also recently come out in BioArchive that I think is quite, quite interesting is something called Cycon. And the difference here is they um, look for transitions and copy number across uh, all of the individual cells. Um, but then what they do is from those transitions and copy number, they build uh, a segmentation of the, of the genome into regions. Uh, and then they reconstruct a phylogeny over the copy number changes within those regions. Um, and in, integ in integrated fashion, they take these uh, noisy raw read counts, cells by bins, that you can see in panel B, um, and simultaneously infer a tree, as you see on the right, and uh, call the copy number, as you see on the bottom in the middle. Um, so, um, another type of analysis you can do is something called pseudobulk analysis. So uh, let's say that we are interested in SMV evolution um, in low coverage data uh, like DLP or 10x CMV. Uh, what we can do is um, cl first cluster the cells by their copy number profiles. Um, or al alternatively, you can also use a uh, Sitka or Cycone to cluster, um, to, to create, to generate an evolutionary tree and then cut the evolutionary tree at certain branch lengths to generate clusters. So um, first step is to generate clusters of cells, uh, as you can sort of see here with the left. Now we have like a, um, an annotation of the cluster across this population of cells. Um, and given that clustering of cells, you can then merge uh, all of the data within those clusters and then use those as um, effectively as just independent WGS data sets from which you can call SMVs, call breakpoints to any of the analysis you would do with a regular whole genome sequencing data. So long as you are able to cluster this, the data into groups of cells that are large enough. And then you can do something like this. Um, where, the, and this is the data um, that you'll be analyzing in the lab, um, where we've looked at SMVs and breakpoints across these um, nine clones, I believe, um, from uh, the OB2295 samples, and then reconstructed a phylogenetic tree across the clones, um, in, including all of the driver events annotated here. Okay, in the last part of the talk, I will go through some of the, the studies that have uh, already been done with uh, leveraging single cell DNA sequencing and uh, talk about uh, just in general where the field has progressed up until now. So um, what we've been able to study so far is uh, clonal evolution, um, therapeutic resistance, so understanding um, how clones uh, and fitness is affected by, uh, by drug treatment. Uh, there's been studies of metastatic dissemination uh, and the dynamic processes by which um, clones populate other, other tissues. And there's been studies of invasion in uh, pre-malignancies. One of the first studies was this study published in 2011 uh, by Nick Naven, 
um, who is now sort of a pioneer in the field of single cell genomics. Uh, and they used dot PCR uh, to sequence 200 cells. Um, this is, I would say the first big single cell sequencing study. Um, and what they found was that um, when they re reconstructed a phylogenetic tree from the, the copy number that they inferred for each of these cells, uh, they described uh, what they saw as uh, punctuated clonal expansion with few persistent in intermediates. Um, in a subsequent study, uh, this, this was also done by Nick Naven's group, um, who studied clonal evolution in breast cancer sequencing um, and uh, using a technique called NUCSEQ. So NUCSEQ is effectively MDA on cells that are in G2M phase. So they have double the amount of DNA available uh, for sequencing, uh, which helps with things like allelic dropout. Uh, so if you have four copies at a particular lo loci as opposed to two, it's less likely that uh, you will uh, lose um, both, you lose an allele uh, when you amplify from those four copies. Um, so this, they applied NUCSEQ uh, to um, understand um, uh, the breast cancer sequencing similar to the previous study. And they found that aneuploid rearrangements occur early and point mutations evolve gradually. And they were able to do this because they combined uh, dot PCR with um, uh, for copy number with uh, NUCSEQ for uh, SNVs. And this was a strategy that was used by subsequently by a few papers, combining multiple types of sequencing. Um, one type of sequencing perhaps is strong for SNVs and one is strong for uh, deducing copy number. And so there's been quite a few studies that and methods surrounding the combination of, of those two types of data. A study by, um, by our group that came out in 2016 used a large uh, amount of whole genome sequencing, uh, uh, targeted bulk genome sequencing and, um, and targeted single cell sequencing to try to understand a clonal evolution uh, and clonal spread in high-grade serous ovarian cancer. Um, and so there was quite a few data modalities in this particular study, but the, uh, the one that was quite useful at understanding evolution was the uh, targeted single cell sequencing that used, it, used custom microfluidics um, and a, a custom panels designed for each of the patients that we were studying. And we were able through uh, using that data to be able to resolve, uh, fully resolve clonal genotypes to be able to understand which mutations were, um, were uh, concomitant in the same uh, cell populations, and then study those cell populations more accurately as, they, um, as, we, as we observed them in different locations within the peritoneal cavity. And what we found was, um, was that there was polyclonal seeding in some instances, so multiple clones seeding the same metastatic site within the peritoneum. And we also found um, examples where mutation loss through copy number change was, was driving uh, diversity, in, genomic diversity in some of the tumors. Uh, much more recently, uh, this paper that I'm um, showing a figure from here is the DLP paper. Uh, and I, I really like this particular result uh, from a fine needle aspirate that we did, that we applied to which we applied DLP. Uh, we were able to extract 220 cells uh, that from a, like a very, very limited uh, sample. So limited that it's possible that um, it wouldn't have been feasible to apply whole genome sequencing or other sequencing techniques to this amount of DNA. But uh, using DLP, we were able to isolate uh, a very small number of cells realistically, um, 220 cells from the sample and then sequence them and then obtain very high quality copy number that allowed us to identify clonal 
and subclonal uh, gene amplifications. In the same study, we looked at, uh, at uh, rare or the events that happened in rare populations or in individual cells um, where we see copy number changes affecting individual chromosomes or spread throughout the genome affecting many chromosomes, even I, I would say sort of catastrophically affecting most of the genome. And these, these are likely the result of um, errors during mitosis or, or missegregation uh, that happen sporadically and contribute to some extent to a small amount of heterogeneity and then may, maybe provide a reservoir for which selection can happen um, if, if by chance one of these mitotic errors happens to lead or amplify a chromosome that um, has added fitness advantage. On the right here, we're showing uh, that for these top two data sets, uh, gains are more prevalent. Um, and this is also associated with the fact that the top two are diploid. The bottom is the bottom right is tetraploid. And in that uh, sample, we saw a prevalence of losses over gains. Um, even more recently, and um, I had in my notes to describe the number of cells that were uh, sequenced as part of each of these studies, but I forgot to mention them. Um, in the, you know, the first few sets of studies that I described from McDavid's group and from other groups were in, in the hundreds, 200s, I think uh, our nature genetic study that on high-grade serous cancer was less than 1,000. The DLP paper was on 50,000 in this a uh, recent paper by Nick Naiman's group is on 10,000 cells. So you can see that the, uh, because of the advances in the technology, that this type of, an out, of, type of data generation is becoming much more scalable. Um, so in this paper, uh, this is again on breast uh, tumor evolution. Uh, they sequenced, I believe, um, eight TNBCs and reconstructed phylogenies. Um, investigated the copy number structure of the of the, um, these tumors using a new method um, that is very similar to DLP. Uh, and they what from this data they were and in, in silico simulations, they were able to update their model from um, punctuated evolution and clonal stasis, which is the first model that they pr proposed back in 2011, to now a model in which uh, there is some ongoing CNA evolution and some transient instability uh, preceded by, so um, initially there's, in their model, there is a punctuated burst that generates a lot of heterogeneity. There's some transient instability that generates a small amount of additional heterogeneity and, and subclonal structure. And then there's ongoing CNA evolution, but at a lower rate. And I think the, um, key sort of question they're trying to answer here is, uh, is there a mismatch between the amount of heterogeneity we see when we look at individual cells um, versus the amount of heterogeneity we would expect um, historically based on a reconstruction of the evolutionary history? Um, is there a mismatch between essentially the historical mutation rate and the um, present day mutation rate, contemporary mutation rate? I think uh, this is the last few slides that we'll finish on studies that use uh, single cell SMB sequencing. This is a study that uses mission bio. Um, now this, the cells here are really starting to increase. This, this is a study of 735,000 cells from 123 AML patients. So a huge study. Um, they used uh, two different types of, gene, of driver gene panels um, to investigate AML uh, and try to understand um, several different aspects of the evolution of AML. In this slide, I'm showing mutual exclusivity between uh, the drivers in individual patients. So each of these um, heat maps and then um, plots on the right are one patient at the top and one patient at the bottom. 
And you can see, especially at the top, there's a striking amount of, um, in fact, it seems that no cells harbor the same, um, two, two or more of the same mutation. So there's a striking amount of mutual exclusivity and independent evolution of, uh, of um, different drivers and presumably clonal competition between these different cell populations that are each harboring their own driver mutations. Uh, from that data, they were able to look deeply at, uh, at what happened to the different populations under, uh, under pressure from uh, chemotherapeutic treatment. And they found a number of different signals, for instance, for clonal selection. Here we have a large bottleneck due to the imposition of this treatment followed by uh, resurgence of uh, new populations uh, that are able to evade the treatment. And then in, in contrast, we have um, essentially what you could say is, is, is failure of treatment to reduce the, the burden of the disease um, and a significant amount of clonal, clonal competition between these different populations with distinct drivers. Um, and the last study I'll talk about is one that we recently published in which we did, applied DLP uh, to uh, serially, pa serially passaged triple negative breast cancer. Uh, on the left, you can see some of the data that was generated here. Uh, I think we had 130,000 cells in this study. Um, and this is probably about 10,000 that were uh, in this particular data set alone. Uh, from which we constructed a phylogenetic tree that you can see on the top right, and then uh, tracked uh, over different courses of treatment and without treatment, how uh, the clonal populations um, and which clonal populations uh, took precedence within the, uh, these xenografts. And you can see that different distinct populations um, have higher clonal fractions at the end of this time series, uh, but different between untreated on the left and treated on the right, as shown by these clonal fractions at the top and then these uh, fitness uh, coefficients on the bottom. Oh, I didn't mean to include that slide. I'll go to the next one. So challenges and future developments. I think um, one challenge and also um, something that's a, po a definite positive is I, I'm pretty sure that um, data generation will only continue to increase as we have methods that do single cell sequencing in um, that are more routine and more scalable. Uh, and as, as sequencing becomes cheap, cheaper, it will allow us to increase the coverage per cell with the same cost and um, also increase the utility of this data, eventually reaching place where we can um, have more accuracy for, say, things like SMVs um, in what previously perhaps was low coverage sequencing data. Yet there's many challenges. I would say um, this is just definitely a very short list that, uh, that I've jotted down here. Um, bin sizes right now um, at the coverage levels that we have in single cell data And uh, copy number with uh, the accuracy that is possible with some of the, the um, assays that have been optimized for SMBs or copy number alone. Um, but that may change um, at some point also. Um, and finally, I think there's quite a bit of work to do uh, uh, yet to be done on phylogenetic models of copy number in single cells as in as I've shown in, the, in these slides, really there's only two methods um, of significance right now and they're both unpublished. Uh, so I think in the future, there'll be a lot of computational development on this side. 